Hello and welcome to the D&D 420 podcast. This is a show dedicated to helping you become a better dungeon master. I'm your host, Eric M. Hunter, and I am a struggling game master trying to figure out how to tell a better story. Joining me shortly is Jimmy Shields. He is the creator of D&D 420 and an avid D&D fan with over 25 years experience. In this episode, we start at the very basic foundation as I start working on creating a brand new campaign. All of this is very basic stuff, and if you are new to D&D or looking for a fresh take on how to build a campaign from the bottom up, this is a great few stepping stones into crafting your story. Okay, so I want to build a campaign, and I've got my world. It's a world that, you know, I know the rules, and everybody else knows the rules. They know the history of the world, so I don't have to worry about a lot of backstory, that kind of thing. And I, I've got three big points in the game that I want to play. So I've got, like, the beginning, kind of first couple of steps uh, in terms of, like, battles and intrigues. I've got kind of the crossing point, and then I've got like the ending kind of bash. Okay, so okay, I uh, that is about as far as I've gotten. So, so you've gotten a lot farther than most people tend to get in the in the first place. Um, so you've got an overall an overarching story is what you have then, correct? Right. With just right. A, a few points, like I know I want to start here. I know I want this turning point to happen, and I know I've got an ending. Right. Correct. Are those associated with uh, battles, key battles, monsters, bad guys? Uh, it's a combination of things. So, like, the first is uh, kind of just a battle um, that – oh, it's it's more of, like, an exploration that turns into a battle. Uh, the next one is more like a, an understanding of new knowledge and what to do with this knowledge that kind of catapult the players into the third part, which is where the game would technically end. But resolution. I, right. So I'm looking at more as like writing a story where okay. we have these characters and that's all set. And then it kind of moves into this motion. Okay. So this is your game world. This is a well-established game world. Oh, okay. So this is uh like, this is a nondescript. <laughs> I don't want to give this away. Non game. world. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. This is uh yeah, be some... as general as possible. All right. Okay. So, you have your setting, you have your your overarching story, and now you're now. Do you have the players? That's the that's the question. I do not have the players. Oh, uh, that's the first thing you've got to do. You got to get players involved and make sure that what you're thinking of is something they're going to want to do. So you can either a find players who are interested in what you're doing already and say, hey, uh, I can put an ad out on Roll Twenty. I can put it uh, uh, go to these websites where people look for games because those things definitely exist out there and find players who are either interested in what you're doing say this is the system this is the gaming world or you find players and talk about it player people that you already know that you play with so that actually brings up a pretty good question because so this will be my fourth game third game fourth game two three this will technically be my fourth game no is it my fifth is it? I think it's your fourth or fifth. Well, I mean, it depends because a couple of them, like, are just things we started, right? We just kind of well, yeah. The, there's it. a couple of games we never really finished just because of life stuff. So okay, we'll just call it four. So we'll call it three, three and two halves. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we just might as well just call it three then. Um, okay. So, so you bring up a pretty good point. So the the other games that I've played. Um, I've made it so that the, the players, once the players have been selected, um, I've allowed them to create any character that they want to do in, you know, obviously not something completely outlandish, but you know, within, within a certain box. And I remember playing a game with you, um, twice where you had actually created the characters and then just allowed the players to choose, um, what would you consider to be the positives and negatives of going either way? Well, I think the positives are time, you know, it depends what you're trying to do. If you're going to do a one-off, make the characters in advance, or if there's only a couple of sessions involved, because I mean, I, I know a guy, I won't mention any names on here, Tommy, who builds his character months in advance. And he knows he's got a backstory and he's been thinking about this character for 
literally months. And then when it gets close to the time, I have to hear about his character for weeks. And so do all the other players. So that's awesome though, because now not only do I get to know the play, the character, um, so does he. And so do the other players. They get to know who his character is as well. So everybody knows his character because he's taken the time to write those backstories and, and come up with things about his personality that other people um, just write chaotic neutral on their sheet, be done with it. So there's positives to both. And I think time is the biggest one. If you're going to play a campaign that only goes one night or three nights, just auction characters, you know, that way the characters fit the game world. There's no talking about it. If the, if everybody's just wanting to play some D and D have characters made, but if you, are going to cultivate a group, you know, cultivate the game together, write the story together, then I think it's important to have all of the all of the pieces in place, all of the puzzle pieces in place so that you can then continue writing your story because you can have a a few things, you know, you got to ask yourself all the W questions. Who who's playing? When when are we going to play? Is it Friday night? Is it seven o'clock? How how are we going to play? Are we going to play in person at my place? Are we going to play on roll twenty? Is it going to be theater of the mind? Is it going to be? Should we bring minis? Are we going to play on a board? Um, what do I need to do as a player? You know, what system are we going to play? What game are we going to play? What's the game going to be like? And I think we all know, you know why we're playing. That's to have a good time. Well, now. There's more to that as well, though. You know, why are you playing? You have a story you'd like to tell, correct? Absolutely. So that's that's one of the things, you know, you need to have fun, too. A lot of people say, oh, you know, the dungeon master, he takes all this time. And uh, there's, you know, both sides of the coin where it's the dungeon master. Is, he forces things upon us, and it's us against him. And it should never feel that way, in my opinion. Or we work together as a group to tell the best story possible. So you need to do a lot of things in order to get to that. And there's a me there's a measure of trust there as well. I think it's fair to say. Um, do, do you trust your dungeon master to make a good call in a sticky situation where nobody knows the real rule? Do you do you trust them to uh, take control and write all of these things? Of course, every player wants to have a part in that. I'm sure to affect the story. To, absolutely, because um, it was one of the things that we had talked about earlier was um, having a character, the DM, to play can greatly influence the game. Say that again. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. So allowing the, the DM to role play a character within the group, basically, um, can have a huge impact over the game itself. Right. Oh, absolutely. Having an, an active NPC in the game is immense. Uh, you can make some big, big changes to the story from within that way. All of your NPCs have a huge effect. What NPCs are there and what their role is, those things make huge impacts on the game. So I'm expecting this to be kind of a like a 10 to 15 session game. So it's not going to be a short thing, so I'm not going to. So I don't feel like I'm going to auction off players, even though somebody who is considered, I'd still consider myself a beginner. Um, I feel like I would have more control if I created those characters. And that's then, true. And then auction that's them true. off, but you can also do another thing. I mean, ask your players again. Ask them if they're if that's something that they want, because that way you'll find out you may have players that are absolutely against it. And I've done mixtures as well, where I have three players who are dying to make their character and have their characters ready long ahead of time. And then I have a guy here or there that might say, you know, just have something ready for me. So I'll make two NPCs or three NPCs and give him a choice. And that's, that's always something you can do as well, have those characters that are connected to the story. That's the nice thing about you making the characters. They're connected to the story immediately. You don't have to waste time getting to know each other. You don't have to waste time um, describing why we're here or why we're friends because the DMs had a chance to write all that stuff already. 
so how much man, so it's <laughs> so it's already feeling like a ton ton of work um because <laughs> you know we're talking about npcs we're talking about backstories we're talking about character creation and connecting those characters together so if I'm at the very so if you were at the very basic of I want to create a game and I want this kind of thing to be strewn throughout the game, like where do you start? Uh, I can I can only harken back to what I you know with the players. Once we got the players and once everybody's decided what what we're doing, then you really need to focus on your tools. Um, so what are your tools? What tools do you want to use? You know your like an NPC is a tool. Apps that you're going to use. What books are going to be allowed? That can be a, that can be a thing in some editions of Dungeons and Dragons because you're talking about, you know, if we play 3.5 like you and I have in the past, um, there are so many books out there for that system. You have to decide which ones are we going to allow and make it so that everyone knows in advance. So that's part of your tools. Um, have random tables. There are so many random tables out there. If you have a setting already, you're going to know lots of things about that setting. Like, is it a desert? Is it a mountain? Um, or is it hot? Is it cold? What's the weather like? What time of year is it? Ask yourself those questions up front because the biggest thing you can do to make the game feel real is know those things ahead of time as the dungeon master some dungeon masters never think of those things they they put oh you know i'm gonna have the players fight these goblins and then i'm gonna have them fight this um this caravan that comes through that that gets attacked and they're gonna defend the caravan and and these things but they never even stop to think is it fall is it snowing is it is it hot how hot is it you know what kind of day is it going to be and there are random tables for that as well if you don't want to mess with it um, but it's good to know what it is. That way, as you talk about what's happening in the game, it's easy for players to relate to those sort of things and to already make them feel connected to what's happening if you describe it properly. Yeah, it's kind of like adding extra to the game. Um, one of the things I noticed about uh, the game that we're playing and now, you gave different uh, terminology to the directions of the world. Of, a, of the way a compass lays so like north isn't north south isn't south like they are different they they mean other things like there's other words that represent those directions and i feel like as somebody on the outside looking in you would think why would you do that like that is so pointless like just do north south east and west like that's what everybody understands why would you create different words that essentially mean the same thing just you know and it kind of goes back to that point of like, that is, that is, you know, the basic of building a world. Like there is history behind this. I don't, we don't need to know what the history is right off the bat, or we don't need to know like how these things came to be, but it's exactly the same things as, you know, why we don't call, why, you know, North and South are called North and South. You know, there's a reason that somebody named them those things. And that's the same thing with why in your world, um, they they mean you know these other terms for that, and I feel like especially as somebody who's still used getting used to this, like that is such a a resounding thought to have because when I'm writing down and I'm trying to outline the game and trying to build the campaign and work on things like that, especially if I'm building in a you know a new environment and not just a something that everybody's familiar with and like trying to create something out of nothing like it may seem kind of silly to waste your time on things like that but at the end of the day like that's what makes the game the game that's what make this makes this world feel so real is the fact that you're not going north you're going um shit i should have brought my notes i wrote it yeah. all <laughs> but do you know what i mean like um, yeah you're going you're going well yeah. Right. So, and that's such a, that's such a hole that you could fall into. Like, when does it become a point where it's too much for the game? Or does it? Well, it's an immersion factor. How, how much do you want to do as a storyteller, as a DM, 
I was told not to call myself a storyteller anymore, but in Vampire the Masquerade, that's the terminology you use for a game master. So I've been a storyteller, and I, I like it because it sounds cooler than Dungeon Master in my opinion. But, but as a, a GM, a storyteller, a Dungeon Master, a Game Master, a referee, whatever you want to call it, um, you got to decide how much work do you want to do. Do you want to go in? Because, I mean, the reason that North, South, East, and West are named the way they are is because of stars in the sky. I decided that because there's a subterranean place where they've never seen the light of day, they don't know what surface world means. They don't know what stars are, that we can't call those directions those things. And it, and it brings you more into that because of it. I have to sell it to you that you live in this place where there is no sky, where there is only the vault, which the city that you live in is located. There's nothing around you. So everything is about this vault. The directions are in reference to the lure of this vault. And it just buys you in and reminds you every time, if you can get your players to go along with it. Now, of course, we've played together for a long time. And a lot of my players and I have played together for a really long time. So they're into that sort of thing. I know you guys are into that. Um, so it's that's another thing that's kind of important to talk with your players about. Make sure that that's the kind of thing they want to do. If you're using a well-established world, those things are done for you. Exactly. But I, I feel like, you know, still making sure that they're part of the game, they're just not assumed. You know, I think that that has a lot to do with it, too. Because I think that those are the things, as a player, those are the things that I feel like I would remember the most. Like those are the things that would stick out the most when I think back on this game, uh, on the story that we've told where it's like, Oh yeah. Like that they weren't just horses. They were, you know, they were beetles with scales and blah, blah, blah. Like granted it, they work like horses and we got from point A to point B like I would on a horse, but it wasn't a horse. Like this was a thing that existed in this world because it evolved from another thing that evolved from another thing that was, you know, um, socialized and cultivated to becoming a point of transportation. Like that stuff to me as a player, that's the stuff that typically sticks with me the most are like those little details, you know? Yeah. And you know that if you're using an established world, learn those details, just a few of them. You don't have to read the whole book. Those books are typically two, 300 pages plus. Read, read the parts that you're going to use in that session and and throw them in there. Just talk about them a little bit. And the, the important thing is to know it over time. So, so, like, you're an established storyteller. You're an established GM. So you you already have those things at your disposal that you you know, okay, when, I, when I've done this before, I did it this way. And, and we were able to have candid conversations about what you could do to make things better. And so um, I think that's, that's big to, to before you start the game, not only talk to your players, but while you're playing, talk to them. And after you're done, talk to them again as well. So being prepared is the next thing that I would say. Um, and that brings us back to knowing the material. It's, it's not important to know all of the material, just some of it, you know, and read if and here's the thing if you don't like to read it's hard to be a game man <laughs> oh for sure if you if you don't like to read i don't recommend it unless your character your players don't read either cuz if they don't read the rule books then heck you can just wing it the whole time and everybody will be happy yeah the rules would mean nothing so but that's okay too those games are fine i just i wouldn't have as much fun because that's not the style of game that's for me and I, I'm sure my style of gaming isn't for everyone. But, you know, it's something else to consider with your players. What level of involvement that's going to be. How much level of involvement there will be with combat. How much level of involvement there might be with role-playing. Because some people like to get into the voices and like to actually physically take the uh, stance of their character or motion like their character. Or even show up to the game dressed as, in, as their character. And that's all cool too. Or there's also um, everything from that all the way to this is a dungeon crawl. This is 
miniatures game where it's all about puzzles, traps, monsters. And that's cool too. I, I happen to like the combination of the two where we can kind of let the let the story decide where where it's no, gonna go. No, that's, no, that's a good point. Um Okay, so one last thing, because you kind of brought it up earlier. Um, one of the things I've noticed that you do is when you have your players create their characters, you always have them start at level three. More than likely, it's always at level three, rather than level one, which you would assume as a beginner, and that's exactly where you would start. You would start at level one. What is your uh, your th your thought behind that? What's your mythology behind that? Uh, well, I think my methods are that when, when you're creating your backstory, I can open up more for you that you weren't just a farmhand in your backstory. You could have been house guard for a nobleman. You could have been um, a cleric that had something happen. And you can that helps you grab a hold of the game and grab a hold of the story yourself and decide at what level involvement as a player that you're going to have. Because if you turn that stuff into your game master weeks before the game starts and you've all talked about your characters, I might feel like what you the story that you have to tell is as good or better than my story that I have to tell. And quite often I find that's the case, that once I start weaving those threads together, we've created something beautiful. And look, it can be three lines that say what your backstory is. You know, you grew up on a you moved to the big city to help with the church, um, and now you're at this monastery. That's cool. That That's enough. Or it could be you were born to this family at this time period, and you spent all this time doing these things, and you tell step by step your process. That gives you a couple of levels to have learned skills and tell that story, even if it is only a page or two long. I don't recommend they go much more than a couple of pages as – it's hard to include everything that the, the player... Well, now, it depends if the player is going to bring it up. If they're going to play it, the more the player will play their backstory, the better off I'm going to be as a game master deciding how that gets woven in. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, because, also, I mean... Oh, go ahead. Also, I was just going to say, I don't use goblins or goblinoids. In this, that's all the first level stuff you fight. And I... I feel like we've all done that so much. Unless I was going to run a game with new players, and I don't know that I'd want to start at level one. And and typically when I did that, I would just level you up at the end of each session until we get to a more fun level to play. Yeah, because... Now that depends. That depends on the the, uh, the edition you're playing as well, however. Some levels are better at different editions. Okay. Yeah, because uh, like the goblin thing, that's, like, that's, a, that's a very video gamey thing. You know what I mean? And I feel like, especially as a beginner... Like, we tend to go back to the things that we're familiar with. So, movies and video games and comics, cartoons, that kind of stuff. Like, we're, and we want to do this very specific thing, but D&D &D is designed in such a way that those stories are basically endless. And what you can do for the most part is basically endless, provided that, you know, your imagination can take you there and, you know, now that I say it out loud, it sounds silly, but it's it's playing within a box that doesn't exist. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, there is a box because we all kind of we all want to play D and D. That's at the end of the day, right? We all want to play D and D. So that's the box we're in. I don't recommend mixing styles like sci-fi and D and D. And hey, if your game does, that's cool too. If that's what your players and you want, that's fine. But I just don't recommend it because it can get sketchy. And the question can become, what game are we playing? You know, when you might have um, one player that shows up just to play D&D. &D, and then the DM starts going, well, there's a spaceship. And then there's there's actually these photon cannons. And then it might not feel like D&D. &D. So beyond that, that's the only box we are in. Is the we're in the Dungeons and Dragons box, or we're in the Vampire the Masquerade, or Vampire box. We're in. It's all based whatever. on whatever story you're playing, right? Yeah. So 
that's the only box. And, you know, I create a big box with my gaming worlds. That's the box there. You've all agreed to play in Volcomenar, the setting that I created for you guys to play in. We all agreed to that. So that's what we play in. That's my box. That's my only limitation. You have no limitations there. But there's still like a con- there's a constant set of rules, much like any game that you have to abide by for the most part. They're just different than what you would say if it was a sci-fi game or, um, you know, like a modern game or something like that. That's what you're trying to say. Right. Gotcha. You're, okay. You can expect certain things. There are going to be dungeons. There might be dragons. But they're probably not going to be laser guns. <laughs> right. No, probably not. <laughs> okay, so... I've got kind of like so you, so you know I've got kind of my overarching uh, idea of how I want the game to for the you know the beginning the middle and the end. Um, I have the the book that we're going to play the edition we're going to play. What would you recommend as like homework for me to do for next time? You know what you're going to want to do now is come up with. Um, I have three levels of NP. I have the completely fleshed out NPC that I'm going to enjoy playing. And I'll make several of those. You don't have to make several, just make one you want to play. Um, I'll make three or four that I might want to play and kind of let the party choose who they're going to go with. And then I'll play that character. The other NPCs can play roles still. They may take a different role in your game or you might erase the name on it, change the level on it, use it later on as a completely different character. Who knows? But the first level is completely made NPCs. The second level of NPC is the semi-fleshed-out character idea. Make a an, an NPC kind of character to go with the randomization I came up with. And I don't need any stats. I just need a name. I need a few personality quirks, a few affiliations, and maybe a job that they're doing. So then when I read those things, it reminds me of who I was thinking of. And I might have a dozen of those, and they may never come into play. But if you talk to a random on the street that I was like, I'm like, why are you talking to this guy? I've got somebody. I've got a a little bit of a personality I can jump to. I've got a little bit of notes about him, things you might hear from that character, things of that sort. And then there's the times when you're at the shop, and I don't, you're not here to um, learn about the story. You're here to buy potions or you're here to buy a new sword because your barbarian broke his blade or whatever. And then you get into it with the shopkeep. Well, then I have a list of names and a random list of occupation and a random list of um, a few personality traits or quirks. And I might choose then what I want to do with that one. I'll pick a random name might pick a random quirk and then i might just give you a little we might just role play for fun and those are three levels of npcs that i think are really good to have on tap okay so that's what i'll do um and then i will send them to you when i'm done with them and then we'll talk about them next time that sounds good Thanks for listening to this episode of the D&D 420 podcast. For everything D&D 420 related, check out dnd420.com. If you'd like to reach out to us, you can find us there on the website and on YouTube at D&D 420. Lastly, as always, if you'd like to support the show, you can do that by telling another DM about the show and by visiting us on Apple Podcasts and leaving a rating and review. Thanks for subscribing and being a part of our work here at D&D 420. We will see you next week.